time is it right now, Eric? It is too late, Max. It's 11 o'clock. And what are we doing at this ungodly hour, Eric? We are about to go tide pulling, Max. And so tide pulling is a really <laughs> fun activity that we like to do when there's a really low tide, so when the water's out really far. And we go out and we look for lots of really cool organisms. And we're here today to show you some of those really cool organisms and talk about the things that are causing them harm and threatening to take those beautiful organisms away from us. Now, let's take an in-depth look at some of the organisms here in the Puget Sound. First up is an organism called an anemone. Anemone's tentacles are lined with loads of stinging cells to both catch prey and deter predators. Luckily, these festive little guys aren't strong enough to harm humans. One really cool thing you can see displayed here is a process called budding. You see, when anemones reach a certain size, they're able to split into two separate anemones. Sometimes, they can form colonies of hundreds of clones. This is a sea star. It has multiple limbs that can regrow when broken off, and they have this thing called mutable collagenous tissue that will sever the bonds between tissue, allowing themselves to be almost liquefied. This allows them to fit more easily into crevices and hide from predators. But sadly, in recent years, it was a rare sight to find a sea star in the Puget Sound because of a virus called the sea star wasting disease, which devastated these communities and was one of the largest wildlife mortality events ever recorded. Luckily, they're showing signs of recovery, and it's really cool that we were able to see these wonderful creatures today. Crabs are a keystone species to intertidal ecosystems. The species illustrated here is called the red rock crab. They, along with Dungeness crabs, are two of the largest fisheries in the Puget Sound. Crabs prey on fish, anemones, other crabs, and underwater plants. In turn, Crabs are eaten by a multitude of birds, seals, anemones, fish, and humans. The other species shown here is called a kelp crab. This species is nocturnal and are rarely seen during the day, but quite common at night. These are sculpins. They are common intertidal fish that can grow up to three feet long. They have some really cool adaptations. For example, they can find their way back to their home tide pool from up to 100 yards away. They can also spend long periods of time out of the water making them very adverse. This one right here is a buffalo sculpin measuring around seven inches. Sculpin are ambush predators, so they remain really still until they strike in a rapid motion. This is why he was so cooperative with us. The white sausage-shaped objects here are the egg cases of an opalescent squid. Each egg case can contain up to a couple hundred eggs, some egg cases being fertilized by multiple males. As other females rub against the laid eggs, pheromones cause them to want to lay eggs too. Sometimes, many acres of sea floor will be entirely covered with opalescent squid egg sacs. Also, the egg sacs are coated in bacteria that helps prevent antimicrobial defense. Now that we've shown you guys the beauty of our intertidal ecosystems, we're going to talk about what's threatening to take that beauty away. Plastics. This pollutant can often be found in the ocean in these habitats and in many of our excursions we see more plastic than the organisms we are looking for. Luckily, that's not the end of the story. And that's up to you guys to reduce the plastic we see in our environment. And so one of the largest contributors of plastic is these single-use items that we don't reuse. So spending the time to invest in, uh, the time and money to invest in reusable products like water bottles, straws, grocery bags, all can have a huge effect and help reduce the amount of plastic that we see. So even though the presence of these tiny creatures may not mean the most to us humans, the presence of us shouldn't mean this much to them.